Hi, this is Kurt Plattenberger with the AirplanesAndRockets.com website. And I'm going to give you a quick introduction to the escapement control that was used on early radio control systems, mainly the rudder-only single channel. Sometimes it was uh, used with a dual channel that they also set it up for elevator and uh, in some cases even a third channel for throttle control. I'm not sure this was ever used on the ailerons. It probably wouldn't be very practical for that. But the basic mechanism is what's called an escapement here. It's made up of a solenoid in the back. The solenoid controls this little arm right down here and depending on whether the solenoid is actuated or not, this arm is either on the outside edge position or an inside edge position and if you look at the control arm on the escapement, you'll see that these two opposing arms are a little bit longer than these two opposing arms. So depending on what the position of this little stop is, it either stops the long arm or the short arm from rotating. And I'll show you in a second what implication that has. The power for the system that actually drives the control surfaces is gotten from a twisted rubber band just like in the, the rubber band powered airplane models and typically in the aircraft this escapement would be mounted up near the front of the airplane where the receiver and battery are up in the cockpit area and then this torque rod that controls the surface would run along the length of the airplane exit out the back in this case for this mocked up rudder um, it has it's bent up in the back and then it is run through this what we would control a control horn for the surface nowadays it's just a slotted piece of metal that runs around this torque rod and as the torque rod moves back and forth I'll just do a quick demo uh, you'll see how it controls the surface itself in this case again a simulated rudder and typically these control horn uh, would be held on with a uh, bolt and nut so that you'd be able to move this up and down and that would end up controlling the throw of the surface I had it in the maximum throw position before now you'll see here in the minimum throw it's farther down on the torque rod so it's just not pushing the control surface as far in this case. If you look back up front you'll see that when the receiver would send a pulse to the escapement it would either be all on or all off and each time a pulse is sent, right now there's the solenoid is de-energized. When I send it a pulse and energize it, it rotates a quarter of a turn. Uh, in this case, it's giving right rudder. And then when I release it, it's back to neutral again. And again, uh, long control arm, short control arm. So when I energize it, it pulls that little flapper in there so that it'll, it allows this to rotate and it stops the short arm. So again, we're at the three o'clock position. We got right rudder, release it. It's uh, at 12 o'clock and the rudder's neutral again. Energize it again uh, at the nine o'clock. We now have right rudder, neutral, left rudder, neutral, right rudder. So the way the systems would normally be operated is if you wanted a right turn, you would send a pulse, the first pulse would actuate the rudder, the plane would get into the, the right turn when it got to the amount of bank that you wanted, you would release and it would go neutral. And then of course the planes back then without ailerons had a lot of dihedral, so that would tend to right the plane again. If you didn't get all the right turn that you needed, you would have to pulse first to the left real quick and release and then pulse again to get back to right. And of course, if you were flying straight and level and you wanted left rudder, you would have to pulse the first time. You have to keep track of where the rudder was last time. Of course, you can just watch the plane in the air to see how it responds and then pulse accordingly. So that's about it. It's a pretty simple mechanism. When I bought this off of eBay a couple years ago, I didn't even know what it was. I just wanted to get a 
escapement that I could set up and do a demonstration like this. As it turns out, um, a few months ago I bought this old edition of American Modeler. It's the July 1957. And I happened to see in the back, in their showcase, it was for new product releases. Um, it had this exact escapement mechanism. It was uh, the Bonner Specialties uh, self-neutralizing forearm escapement. And uh, it was called the single. So, and it was advertised as a higher torque version of an escapement and I'm guessing that's because the distance here between the rotation point and the actual control arm itself is pretty short which would end up uh, giving you more more power to be able to uh, move a control surface and that's typical that if you have a, a fixed amount of power going into the system then the closer it is to the point of rotation the more force it's going to be able to exert. It's the same thing if you look at uh, just using your elbow as the pivot point in your hand or in your arm here that the the far for the given amount of force that you can apply or torque around the, the elbow axis point the force is going to be greater the closer to the pivot point it is. It, it's a lot harder to stop a force close to the pivot point than it is to stop a force farther away from the pivot point, so I'm sure that's what it's working on. Uh, that's about it. I've got about four volts from this power supply driving the actuator, the solenoid. I'm not sure how much the systems back in the day used, probably around six volts. A lot of them used the wet lead acid batteries in the early days and then later on went to the nickel cadmium once they became available. So that's it for now. Thanks for watching.